so as, as you guys know, I'm Nathan Rain. I'm at Washtenaw Baptist University. Uh, I teach biology. I have a 12 hour course load and, a, and then I do a small research component as well to my project. And so what I, what I wanna talk about is just sort of how we've approached incorporating bioinformatics into our class and to um, our classes at, at Washita as sort of a, as a beginning um, thank you and acknowledgement. I need to acknowledge my colleague, Ruth Plymel. Almost everything I talk about today is, is really a we, not an I. And, and Ruth, uh, Dr. Plymel is, is my number one collaborator in these things. And so, you know, I, I just wanna make sure that everyone realizes that this is really a group project and I'm presenting a, a whole effort from a team more so than exactly what I'm doing. And then I'm also work with Dr. Blake Johnson, who's done a lot of work helping get us get ready on the C Bio Portal project that we're talking about. And it's sort of as a, as a background, I have some bioinformatic knowledge, but not really. Um, in 2000, my, my claim to fame during my PhD was that I sequenced a, a fragment of a gene that turned out to be a MAP kinase. In 2002, the first draft of the rice genome came out, and I used this new software called BLAST to take my sequenced fragment and blast it across this new genome that we just heard about, and we identified all the MAP kinases that were in the rice genome, and then we did some sequence alignments to show how they work and how similar they are to each other. I never used command line, and I never used code. And so that's really the bulk of all my bioinformatic knowledge for about a 10 year period. And so it wasn't until about 2010, until we really started working into the bioinformatics. And so a lot of people think that you have to have this in-depth knowledge, but I, I think I'm a case in point that you can kind of learn this stuff on the fly as we move forward. One of the things that we, we click, quickly learned at Washita was that when we tried to incorporate bioinformatics into the classroom or data analysis into the classroom, it was real similar to just showing them a piece of a puzzle or a whole box of the puzzle. And what happened was students lost the context of what they were trying to learn and they would get bored and they would often sort of quit listening to these types of things and it was really hard to apply it. And so what we found was we really had to give them more pieces of the puzzle. We had to show them the box. Sometimes we had to put it mostly together and let them put one or two pieces in to fill it out. Or sometimes we had to give them a partially put together puzzle, but still have some critical thinking, but it still showed them in context what they want to do. And so as we started developing our, our curriculum that incorporated bioinformatics, that became the key is how do we show them how to do these things in context. And our problem was, is that when we took this traditional learning approach for how we saw bioinformatics, where students needed to learn, take some computer science classes, we need to run them, then run them through some statistic classes, and then maybe even some more data management and data generation type of classes. And once they accomplished all of those goals, then we let them analyze the data. And that really becomes the puzzle pieces, right? They're lost. They don't really know what to do or where to go. And so what we decided to do was to take a practical skills approach where we would give them the data generation, we'd give them the data collection and the data management, and we would do all of that first. And we would use that to then drive our other types of uh, bioinformatic analysis that we do. So they could help generate hypothesis, they could start integrating different types of omics, um, data where we look at proteomics, transcriptomics, all these types of things that they can start integrating together. And that really fits more of the puzzle type of thing where we have parts of it put together, then they can start mixing and matching in context and see what they're doing. And so we began to do that. We then had to think about, well, what type of analysis fits these types of plans and how can we do these things? And so um, we, we focused on DNA barcoding, viral genome annotation, RNA sequencing, proteomics, and genomic analysis. And so really what I'm going to present today is these projects and how we took these projects and put them into the classroom. And so we, we want to scaffold these into the classroom. And so really the, the big places I'm going to present today is our freshman general biology one class, 
it's a cure. It's a course embedded undergraduate research experience. It's something that that I'm very passionate on, something my colleagues and department is passionate in, where we create everything within a research experience that the students have. So instead of traditional labs where one week you do this, the next week you do that, we now put everything together in a giant context of a research project. And the freshman gym bio lab is done by Dr. Plymel, and it's changed a little bit, but some of the te techniques that we use has, has remained the same. Our freshman bioinformatics class is sort of a one-off class that students can choose to take in the spring. And then that feeds down into our cell biology and our histology classes, which has some of this cancer bioportal projects and then independent research that we do. I have microbiology on here, but I won't speak about it. So this is the, a project that Ruth Plymel works on. This is her research and she does a phenomenal job doing bioinformatics in that class as well. But just for time straight and, and my familiarity with what all she does, I just left it out of today's presentation. So in Gen Bio, we kind of settled as on DNA barcoding as our one of our first freshman projects. And so this lab has moved around. Sometimes they've looked at characterizing insects that might be in a forest situation versus insects that might be in a grassland situation. They've done kombucha where they've looked at different fungal. Um, cultures that make the kombucha uh, taste better or more fermented or all kinds of different situations. And so whatever the context of what they're analyzing, one of the things that we can put in there is this DNA barcoding. It's very simple. Uh, we can order a kit based project. The kit is made to be sort of a modular thing where students can do this in a three week time period. But what we've done is we've taken this module and we've added it to the bigger construct of the, of the cure. It costs about $25 to do the sequencing. Just then get the sequencing reads. They can then begin to an analyze and look at their data um, in all kinds of several, all kinds of different contexts. We settled on using the DNA subway because it's a, it's a graphical interface. Everything that we're doing, we, we try to find a graphical interface that'll allow the students to do the analysis, but not be stuck at the very beginning, trying to figure out how to code or how to develop the, 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 the analysis pipeline for this. And so what's really nice about the subway, it's free, students can log in. We, there's information that tells them help, so you can click on this DNA barcoding 101, it pulls up videos and how-tos that can help the students. Students can then click on it, and they can move forward. We have also developed sort of a screenshots with um, instructional information on it. As sort of a side note, this also works really good for high schools. And so we're finding that we can give high schools these screenshots and they can start doing these projects in the context of a, of a high school science class. But we can also have conversations with the students as we move forward. Well, why do we do one barcoding um, primer for one particular animal versus another? What does it mean to look for these types of stuff? We can have conversations about FASTA files and what does it mean to have a trace from your sequencing and how to look at your trace. And so we're having all these conversations in context of what they're doing and what they're looking at. And so it's really nice. We can walk them through it. They can analyze it. They can upload it. There's a, a wealth of things that you can do on the subway. They call it stops along the subway. And so Students don't have a lot of choices or a lot of decisions to make along the subway, but remember we're freshmen and we're just happy that they're going through it and we have some conversation. Why do you do a muscle alignment versus some sort of other type of um, phylogenetic tree, uh, for instance? And so we have these conversations. They can create their graphs and then they can analyze the data. Another sort of very important aspect of this is that their data can be downloaded and exported into other tree viewers. So they can see how their data works in context of other people doing DNA barcoding. So now we're part of a big community and now they can take their data and they can move it to other software and compare data from one software versus results from a different software. And so this really opens up what we can do with the freshmen and conversations that we can have with the freshmen. And sort of as a, as a case in point, out of a, as a completely unrelated research project, these students were trying to look at um, animals that were coming towards a, a dead pig, and they were trying to, to look at the decomposing 
uh, process of the pig and what kind of insects there at different times. And they happen to find this American burying beetle. It's an endangered um, species. It's not, it's only found in Arkansas at Fort Chaffee. As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a certain part of Fort Chaffee that's now gated off because it's the only place where it's found in the state of Arkansas. And so we found this, this insect. And so we had a um, accidental collection permit for this endangered species. And so we were able to, to take it and the students got to thinking, well, we did DNA barcoding um, in class and we've been working at DNA barcoding. Why don't we try to barcode this, this um, insect that we caught? And so part of their research project of characterizing where they found it and the taxonomic structure of the insect, we then also wrote up the DNA barcoding analysis. And sure enough, it was 99.9% .9 identical to the DNA barcode reference genome that was put up by um, the zoo in St. Louis. The, the St. Louis Zoo is one of the, the main places where they, they're working with and doing research with this thing. So it was really neat to take what they did as a freshman and then turn it into a larger type of research project. The, the, the one-off class is our phage bioinformatics class. And so we've been into the HHM, HHMI's Science Education Alliance for about 10 years. Ruth Plymel, Dr. Plymel, and myself got into this program pretty early on. And what happens is freshmen in the fall will isolate a bacteriophage. They'll spend time characterizing, working with that bacteriophage. We sequence one of those phages over the summer, and then they spend the semester analyzing and looking at these phages. And so, you know, once again, we're using a, a graphical interface type of software. We're not coding but then we have different questions in a decision tree that we have to make. So does it make sense that this is the right frame? Where are our promoters at? Where are the ribosome binding sequences? Is the sitany right? So is this gene lined up the way we understand how genes are usually ordered and put together within a larger context of a viral genome? And so there's a lot of decisions that they have to make and they're freshmen. And this is really done as a just in time type of learning, so I don't lecture in the class. I really don't give them much background information. I just tell them to start rolling. When they have problems, then we stop and we'll have two days worth of conversation about what it means, what a shine dark garnel sequence means and why that's important. They keep rolling again, more problems, and we keep doing that till they can annotate this entire genome. And a genome is somewhere between 60 and 100,000 um, base pairs. We have somewhere between 75 and a in a hundred um, proteins that they have to annotate and genes that they have to look for. But we don't just annotate the genome. Once we, once we do that, the next step is to then go through and look for other types of features that might be of interest within uh, these genomes. And so, you know, there we'll see that there's gaps between genes. And so why is there a gap between these genes? Most viruses or prokaryotic or organisms have very little gaps there. All the genes are kind of stacked up together in these cassettes. And so we have to have these conversations of what might be in these gaps. And then students then research different software that they would use to investigate these other types of, of projects. And so what you see here is a poster that we did a couple of years ago where we identified promoters and terminators and repetitive elements um, that are kind of unique to this particular phage. No, no coding really is involved with this. Students spend time researching the, the literature, finding software online, and then investigating which one works, and then trying to interpret the data in the context of this phage they spent the semester annotating. And so, you know, we got to thinking, we really want to get the kids to really understand the context of what they're doing and the importance of what they're doing. And we realize that there's not much difference between a a college freshman and a high school senior. And so we created the Genome Hackathon where the students invited high school students to campus to then work through the annotation of a novel bacteriophage. So one of the things that we do is we have the students, they spend time trying to figure out teaching components of all the different software that we use in the class. And so this is a real cool learning tool where yeah, they've used it, they understand it, but now they have to make all these teaching components. So we bring the high school students in, now they're ready for any problems or issues. And so it's a big difference between learning and using the software than it is to actually teach 
a high school kid who's never even thought about this, the software. And we do this a six hour day. 2019, we invited University of the, of the Ozarks from, from Clarksville and Sean Coleman and his group came down. And so they were in the phage lab. So really was really fun because we had his college students who are doing phage bioinformatics. We had my students who were doing phage bioinformatics. And then we had about 25 to 30 high school students and their teachers on campus. And we all spent the day working through this genome. In 2020, uh, right before COVID hit, we had 90 high school students um, registered to come to campus. We had a whole floor below the cafeteria that we were going to have to um, rent out, bring them all in. It was going to be a really big deal. We were so excited and then COVID hit. This year, we're actually doing, we're planning a virtual um, several day genome hackathon and it's all student led. So students right now from last year's class are developing the, the curriculum and what we're going to do. And then next year's, uh, next semester's class will develop videos and the teaching content and we'll invite the high school students to campus. Uh, another thing that's came up because of COVID is how do we go to these online labs? And so if you just do a quick search of the internet, you'll see that there's a, a, a ton of ideas for doing online labs. And most of them are sort of simulations where you, you go and you do a virtual worm dissection or you do some sort of animation and students interpret the data. But through my Cell Biology Education Consortium, um, we've kind of created a group and we thought, well, how can we do an, a data analysis project that is real world, that has significance, that we're not simulating stuff, we're actually generating data that we could use because that becomes one of the key components of creating a cure. And one of the things that we came upon was this cancer bio portal or C bio portal. And C bio portal is an amazing website. It's free, it's open source, and it allows students to analyze data in a wealth of different avenues and contents. And so essentially what happens is as people do cancer-related clinical trials, they upload all their data onto this website. This website is, is a graphical interface. It turns everything into a statistics, turns everything into graphs. It gives us all kinds of data and information. And so this is, what I have here is one clinical trial that's been uploaded. There is probably 300 um, clinical, different clinical trials that are there. Yeah, if you look, this one clinical trial has 10,000 clinical cases that have been uploaded to it. Right, so huge data set. And what students can do, if you look at the boxes, um, you'll see that you can, students can click the boxes and every time you click a box, it regenerates the figures in the context of the box. And so if we wanna see what genes are operated in breast cancer, then we click the breast cancer gene. If we wanna cross list genes for breast cancer that metastasize to the lungs, then we click the breast cancer gene and at the very bottom, which says um, metastatic site, then we click lungs as the metastatic site, and it'll completely regenerate all of our graphs and give us new information related to the context that we want to do. So students can do this analysis. They don't have to code. They're spending most of their time hypothesis generating, thinking about the problem and the question they want to answer. However, one of the other things that's really kind of interesting is the Onco query language. It's a very simple search terms that you can put in. So clicking the boxes work and, they, and, and they're interesting at first, but they also get kind of clunky towards the end. So what we're seeing now is pushing students towards using the Onco query language and they can look up the search terms and how to, how to type the search terms into the, the query function of it, which will generate more detailed analysis, which will help fine tune the types of data that they can analyze and look at. And so, you know, using that context, I just put map kinase one, kind of a map kinase guy. And so um, I put that into the, the, the query search and we can quickly start seeing where it's been upregulated, where it's been downregulated in, in these studies. We can find out the types of um, mutations that, that are found, whether or not it's been amplified, where it's been deleted. Quickly as putting that in there, we can see where it's been co-occurred. So what genes are also found mutated or upregulated with it. And so students can start analyzing and looking through this data. And once again, they're getting statistical analysis, they're getting values, 
And so we're still trying to get them to analyze and interpret the data. And just further on, as you, as you click stuff, this just brings up um, a whole statistical analysis that was that the software quickly ran after I typed in my, uh, my search criteria. It tells me different areas that maybe we should start looking through. And so one of the differences that it found was difference for sex versus male or female. You can click on that. It'll then bring up the data separated by sex. And the other graph here is uh, mutation counts um, found in females with this particular cancer or this particular gene and the cancer type versus males. And so there's all kinds of different questions and queries that students can make in Cancer BioPortal. We, we just finished uh, um, writing a publication. As a matter of fact, an hour ago, I, I uploaded the, the final corrections for, our, uh, for this publication. And so um, we were confident by now it's, those will be accepted and it will be published where we, we sort of thought about how this would work in a, in a class situation. And one of the things I really want to point out is as they're going through these analysis, we're also having them read the literature and we're really focusing on hypothesis generation where students generate a hypothesis and they generate an analysis pipeline of how they're going to go back to this software and analyze it. Um, and that becomes a real big part of what we're going to do. And we assess most of that through presentations and, and written formal papers. And different groups are doing it at different times. I've done it throughout the course of the semester, my um, cell biology class. I'm also teaching a histology class. And so we do it in a different context in histology, but we're still using the same software. So in my personal research, I, I'm now doing sequencing and RNA sequencing specifically. And as I told you, I started doing rice research and Sanger sequencing. I've never done RNA sequencing. But, you know, about the same time I tried to get into this, my washing machine broke and I didn't have any money to fix it. So I drug the washing machine out into my, my driveway. I pulled up a YouTube video and I washed it on a tablet, pink tablet, borrowed from my daughter. And I sat there and I watched the video and I, could, and I replaced the motor and I replaced this control mechanism. And I thought, man, if I can do that with watch YouTube videos to repair my washing machine, surely there's videos that'll show me how to do RNA sequencing. And that's exactly what we did. And that's how we got started doing RNA sequencing. Our first RNA sequencing experiment was uh, looking at glioma cells that were treated with exosomes. I told Rob Griffin that I could do the data. I had no idea what we were doing. Um, but I watched my videos, my students watched our videos, and we began working forward. We've published that data now. So uh, I was very proud to be able to publish that data. We've done four RNA sequencing projects. Now we've published two of them. And so we just had a really nice uh, PLS one paper with a student as a co first author doing all the bioinformatics uh, for that analysis and for that paper. And this week we just got our data back and we're about to begin a, another um, a whole new project looking at lung um, cells that we've knocked some stuff, knocked some genes out, and we're trying to figure new, help find new, new targets for um, chemotherapy. And so once again, we're using a graphical interface. And so I like to use BaseBase. Um, it's a luminous sequencing analysis hub. It, it, it takes the data, it, everything works in, in this graphical interface so we can start working through the different pipelines without having much coding knowledge or no coding knowledge at all. We're reading software. Illumina gives you some suggestions of different pipelines that you can start working through. And this is a lot of data. So the lung cancer data that we just um, got back is 41 gigs of, of information. And so we're trying to work with a lot and it's really nice to work with it within this cloud type of um, pathway. Once we go through an Illumina's um, analysis hub, I move it all the way through a differential gene expression. And what a differential gene expression is, is when I take the control gene expression, I subtract it from our experimental gene expression, whatever's left, those are interesting or differentially expressed genes. I take those genes and then I move them to another um, pathway called iPathway Guide. And this is a really nice pathway mapping software. It's, it's a little expensive. Um, it costs about $3,000 for 25 runs or about $300 per run. 
I will say that um, base base is not free as well, but our first analysis, we have first publication, they give you free uh, credits when you first enroll. And so I did part of the analysis. I moved it over to my uh, student. She did part of the analysis. And then my wife all of a sudden got her a new account. And we and my wife finished the analysis under her account. And we did all that for free. But as we've moved on, it, it, it's worth paying for the, for the software and moving through it. What I like about iPathway Guide is, once again, it creates everything in a, in a graphical interface that we can start looking at but we can re-examine the data in real time. So we're not stuck. So we don't just get a graph that we're stuck interpreting. What happens is very similar to CBioPortal, students can then change the criteria in the search engines and it'll generate new graphs, new pathways, and new processes depending on what they want to do. And so we can look at genes that are being upregulated or downregulated uh, within a context of a question or a gene ontology term. We can create new sequence of analysis subs to show how all these genes interact with each other. What you see here is the gene, gene, on, gene, ontology, gene ontology analysis that we've done, where we can look at all the genes with a certain characteristic and whether or not they've been upregulated or downregulated. And what's really cool is that the data that I'm showing here was actually generated by a student at University of Arkansas Little Rock under the direction of Dr. Leacock, um, who's a faculty member there. And so what's really cool is once I generate, once I pay for that analysis, I can share it freely with anybody and they can start analyzing the data and generate new graphs in the context of whatever question they're into. And so it's really nice. You can give these to multiple students within the classroom and they can start generating new graphs using the same data set and it no longer costs you extra money or fees. Her, Stephanie, Dr. Leacock's work was looking at um, genes that could be potential homologs in Planera, and it was a really neat project that they did, um, and they began to do their own bioinformatics analysis based on that. They also started feeding those genes into Cancer BioPortal to see how they relate to different cancer types. And so it's a really neat way of taking this data and applying it um, across multiple approaches or multiple ideas. And so my keys to RNA sequencing is collaborators, collaborators, collaborators. Dr. Rob Griffin at University of Arkansas Medical School has been my, has been a phenomenal collaborator. I could not do any of this without his help. He is, he is, he keeps recommending me to people. I've gotten more data than I know what to do with. I just got some more microRNA data that he told someone, that, oh, I know a guy who can work on this, and then I give it to my students. So it's been so awesome. Every core vouchers are, are important. Um, I've not sequenced anything on my own. I keep writing Embry core vouchers. One of the reasons that Dr. Griffin needs me is because there's an undergraduate requirement. So it kind of keeps us together and it's really nice. I also would recommend uh, researching uh, pipelines that are easy to use. Often people try to go into script heavy uh, pipelines, but they can't script or code, and that becomes a bottleneck. And we've ran into that problem. So research what you're doing. And that leads me to my final sort of keys, is the journey is important as the success as a destination. And what I mean by that is we spend a lot of time researching and talk about how we're going to analyze the data. We spend a lot of time trial and error and seeing what works. We turn those into student projects. We turn DNA barcoding. We spent two or three semesters just looking at the wrong way and the right way to isolate DNA. Can you, do you need a leg of the bug? Can you do it from the antenna? Do you need the whole size of the bug? We need all kinds of stuff. RNA sequencing, we spent a year thinking about and discussing the best software and analyzing the software. And we turned those into student projects. So students were working on finding new things. Everything then comes into the classroom, becomes our class research experience, funnels back into independent research. We do most of this in the context through the um, through CBEC. CBEC is um, sort of tasked with, we have NSF funding, we're tasked with helping incorporate bioinformatics and tissue culture and, and research into the cell biology classroom. And so a lot of times we, 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 we rely on the faculty and students who are involved with CBAC. And that, that's been a really, really benefit to us in, in moving forward with that. And so I, I would say that one of the things that we've ran into is that 
we have issues. And so I always ask the students, you know, what, what's this figure mean to them? And they say, well, the, the, the tiger, you know, we should be the tiger and we should attack, you know, these projects. And I, I say, well, no, the, this gazelle, you think this gazelle did its best? And the answer is yes, the gazelle did its best to get away from the tiger, but sometimes our best just isn't good enough. And so you'll run into problems when no matter what you do and how you try, you'll have problems and you'll have issues. But don't let that discourage you. Just do it anyway. Keep trying, keep plugging along, and, it, and it'll work eventually. And it, it, it's worked well for us. And when, like I said, we have no real bioinformatic information or abilities uh, before we got into these projects. And the other thing is involved students. Um, I've had the fortunate um, or unfortunate, depending how you want to think about it, to have a ton of students to work in my lab. I've had 27 students in my lab since 2015, so I have an army of students looking for projects, looking for things to do, but they're the ones who are doing the work. They're the ones who are researching the software. They're the ones who are trying the software. They're the ones who I'm trying to say, keep plugging along. You're doing a good job. Um, with that, I need to thank Ruth Plymel again, my, my collaborator at OBU, all my collaborators at UAMS and Arkansas State, and I'll end it and see if there's any questions or, or discussions um, from here. Nathan, this is David Donnelly. Uh, great job, that was, that was awesome. Um, I'm curious on your cancer bio portal um, assignments, do you have them pick a cancer or a, a, a clinical trial to start with, or do you have them start with a gene, or have you tried it both ways? What works best? Yeah, I try it both ways. So um, in cell biology, they have to have a paper related to their the drug of choice that we're going to look at in the context of whatever cancer they're growing in the tissue culture room. And so a lot of times they'll choose a cancer or they'll choose a gene related that was found in that um, in that paper. And so that becomes the context of what they begin. And they start with, an, with sort of an observation and sort of a survey of what's going on in that gene. And then they keep fine tuning that data to where they wanna go. And that they do that over the course of about six weeks in about two to three different presentations. In my histology class, they choose a cancer type, but what they're tasked with is finding something that could be used as a diagnostic tool for a particular cancer. So, um, you know, one, one group is looking that, at when this gene for um, prostate cancer metastasize. And so, you know, they think they found a gene that always seems to show up being upregulated when in all the patients where prostate cancer was the initial cancer, but then it metastasized to somewhere else. And so, you know, they're trying to develop this as a test where maybe we look for this test when they do a biopsy to determine whether or not we remove the, the prostate cancer or we let it lie, right? Which is a pretty common thing for prostate cancer. Um, you know, there's another group looking at breast cancer metastasis and they found genes associated with moving to the, to the liver. And so how do we, we analyze that? And so it really kind of depends on the class, but it is amazing the amount of, of questions that you can ask from one website um, that's out there. Well, thanks.